Thank you very much, Sue. And um, I have to say that I, I hope that the relaxed mode of the two dogs, whose names I'm not going to say in case that alerts them to the fact <laughs> we're talking about them, um, that their relaxed nature is not an indication of how interested they are in this particular <laughs> conversation. I have to say, when I was first asked to moderate this uh, discussion, I, of course, was very enthusiastic, but I also was really confident that it would be a really short discussion, because the question that we're asking, can dogs heal hearts and minds, seems to me to have a very obvious answer, and that is, of course, yes. I have two dogs, and they are, without doubt, the keepers of the emotional well-being in my household. But there is always a but when you look at these things. And in fact, as Sue just mentioned, the scientific evidence around the dog-human relationship, how it works, why it works and whether it is worth pursuing is, I suppose, less uh, finite than we might think if we just go on our own personal uh, judgments and our own personal responses. So tonight we will explore some of those questions around the dog-human relationship and particularly in relation to how dogs can help people and people in particular who are suffering from PTSD. Um, a full a note to you that this full uh, night is being recorded by ABC Radio National. It will be played a little later on the Big Ideas program and also it will be a podcast. And do feel free to share tonight's discussion uh, using the hashtag BoldLTU. I thought before we start, it might be interesting. I do note that this is a, um, a I think from what I can see in the darkness, a predominantly female audience. And of course, we do, thank God for Kevin, to bring a bit of balance to the panel. <laughs> we have a predominantly female yeah. panel. I thought it would be interesting to know how many people in the audience actually own a dog? I'm not in there. OK, maybe I'll, I'll just put your hands down. How many people don't own a dog? That's easier to see. And next question, how many people own a dog that is a service dog of some sort, an assistance dog of some sort? That's terrific. It's really good to know who's here and, and who our audience is. I should tell you something else. I hope you don't mind. Tiffany was so fond of her dog who passed away recently that she's been made into a ring. I didn't know that you could do this, but it's a lovely thing. And in actual fact, I love my dogs to bits, so there you go. Something that you can do. I should actually, I should explain that, shouldn't I? It's ashes that yeah. go into a... <laughs> God, no, that could have got a bit weird. It's a perfectly... That's perfectly... Not the actual dog. Dog. No, no. no. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. It's a, I shouldn't have gone there like that. OK, let's, uh, let's tidy this conversation up and let's start with a really specific example, or in fact, 68 examples, because I think, Kevin, that's how many dogs you've told me that you have trained. In the words of Scott Morrison, how good are your dogs? <laughs> uh, I think they're great. I think that they do what they're meant to do. They do the job of work that they have to do. And uh, they have a good time doing it. Their handlers benefit from them. But more than that, they form a partnership with their handler, and it's a partnership towards wellness. So together they can work towards empowerment, towards wellness. Um, so the dog by itself is a dog. The handler by, the hand by itself is a handler. Put the two of them together and you get a team, and that team working well together takes the handle into empowerment and wellness. And, and that's often also a psychologist working in there as well, isn't it? I mean, can, yes. you, can you give us a sense of what you train dogs for? We all know about seeing eye dogs. Uh, we probably have some idea of other assistance dogs, but give us the gamut of what okay. you train. We deal mainly with a cohort of folks that are challenged by psychological or cognitive issues. So we're talking about autism, PTSD, post-traumatic uh, post stress, epilepsy, epilepsy alert, media alert dogs and people suffering with severe anxiety and depression. That's the main cohort that we work with. Obviously, it does come with comorbidities of, of physical or other disabilities, but uh, the challenges that we work mainly with are cognitive and psychological. And, and Sue mentioned that your journey sort of started in Israel. It started with your son. You were looking for a, an assistance dog for him. Yes, I have a son who's very autistic. And uh, we did try and train a dog ourselves, and that was a nightmare, and didn't work. My daughter became afraid of dogs, and my son became afraid of dogs. And when he got to around about 16 or 17, and we really did need some assistance, that's my son with his first service dog up there, um, but that was down the line. We tried to find somebody in Australia to do it, and we spoke to every single trainer. We didn't find somebody who had the depth of knowledge of autism and the complexity of autism. Um, so via contact, we went overseas and we met a gentleman by the name of Yeriv Ben Yosef, and he sits out there in the audience. And um, yeah, we convinced him to do a dog for us. And uh, the dog's name was Spot. My son got Spot when he was 18 years old. And that's actually a pic of him with Spot 
working on the bonding, and that's uh, one of the bonding activities, and they bond very closely together. And from that moment onwards, he actually lived with the dog and, uh, and, was, you know, and, and lived with the dog and enjoyed being with the dog, and the dog started to in influence his life. But um, one of the things that we needed the dog for was my son was a runner. He used to run um, without warning, and you couldn't really catch him. So we couldn't actually travel. We couldn't go anywhere. We couldn't camp. Um, that's <laughs> with us out camping. And um, we got a smooth collie because her instinct is to herd people together. So she would herd us together. We were the flock of sheep. And my son was one of the sheep. And uh, she herded us together. And over a period of time, indeed, she stopped him running away. And uh, he stopped running away. And it's, it's, we were able to go traveling. And I think um, we were actually able to go bush. We liked a caravan. And we were able to go bush with him, with the family. And uh, that's us going bush. And um, that's him with his dog. And wherever we are, you see he's got a, a tennis ball in his hand. That was one of the bonding exercises we had to do. So wherever we go, doesn't matter where, so he does his exercise with the dog. And that's a, a marvelous thing. It gives him a responsibility, and it gives him something to do with the dog, and um, gives him a friend. And the, the other most amazing thing about the dogs you train, and I've seen another dog, a seizure alert dog, and the most amazing thing about that is that you're not training a dog for commands. You're training a dog for basically instinct, and yes. God knows how you do that. But tell us about the seizure <laughs> alert dog, and that the tennis ball plays a role there too. Yes. Um, uh, together with the dogs that we, um, we train, we train specifically dogs to alert prior to a medical emergency, prior to an anxiety emergency, and prior to seizure alert, to seizures. Um, three to five minutes before a seizure, and with some of them, it's a lot longer than three to five minutes, but uh, we're happy on three to five minutes. The dog will alert the handler that they're going to, or the handler's uh, support team, if they're little people. We work a lot with uh, Drave syndrome, with youngsters, with seven, eight, who are, have uncontrolled seizures. And the dog barks, is that? The bog, dog, we, primarily we train the dog to bark, but if the person, if a handler doesn't want the barking, we train the dog to, we have one client where the dog will actually lick the client's face. So generally what we do is the dog will learn to lick the face and then if the person doesn't listen, to bark and if the person still doesn't listen, to pull their pants until they're going to sit down and be in a safe mode. And then the dog stays with them over a seizure, looking after them and watches them towards the end of their seizure to try and bring them back. So we try and prevent the clusters. But having a dog that's going to alert you prior to a seizure allows you to go out, allows you to do things without this constant fear that you're going to fall down, without the constant fear that you're going to hurt yourself. And it, T Tiffany, you, you've partnered with Kevin's organisation for this Latrobe uh, study, and I should say that means that Kevin is in charge of these two, <laughs> and these two are going to be outside at the end, but please do be incredibly gentle with them, and I've been told that if they do anything bad, I'm not to be at all nasty, because no. they're very young and they're still in training. But Tiffany, when you hear Kevin's story, you, you almost think, well, why do we need a Trobe University study into PS, P PTSD and how dogs can help? I mean, isn't this evidence enough? Yes and no. Uh, it, is, it is evidence, absolutely, and these kinds of reports are not uncommon. So I've had the opportunity to talk to many people with various types of assistance dogs over the past few years, and the sort of stories that Kevin has, has described, you know, people feeling confident to go out for the first time in years, people sleeping through the night because their child with autism suddenly can sleep through the night. These sorts of things are reported over and over and over again. But the standard for scientific evidence isn't just anecdotes. We need to collect data in a very systematic way. And unfortunately, the scientific evidence to date hasn't really caught up with what people are saying that they're experiencing from these assistance dogs. So we need more research, we need long-term research with uh, a fair few people, so you know, more than, more than five, for example. So we'll be having 20 participants in our trial. Uh, and we need to collect data over before they get the dog to find out what life is like 
bef you know, before the dog comes into their life, and then after they get the dog, so we can follow them through the transition process and the long-term sort of outcomes. And, and that sort of evidence is what the whole field needs to, to build a stronger evidence base. So in your study, how, I mean, these dogs are uh, obviously unassigned and untrained, so to speak. They're much better trained than most dogs probably already. Right. But, but so what's the process? You train them, then you match them. You match them, then you train them. How does it work? So Kevin uh, can speak to his program, um, but <laughs> as I understand it, um, Kevin, tell me if I'm wrong about this, uh, the, Kevin finds the client first, usually. So we get veterans on board. Um, because PTSD is a very individualized disorder, they'll all have different needs, they'll all have different goals that they would like to accomplish. And on the basis of what the veteran says that they want to achieve with the help of an assistance dog, Kevin will select a dog on that basis. And where La Trobe comes in is that for the first year of the puppy's life, when they're adorable, but not quite ready to be an assistance dog yet, La Trobe University students and staff are acting as puppy raisers. So they'll basically have the puppy in their home for a year, just living full time as a, as a pet dog, with the key difference that these puppies will go everywhere that, they're, that, the, that the raiser goes. So they'll get lots of different experiences. They're here tonight having a good time. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, and so they go to the office, they go to the, to the lab, to the restaurants and cafes and so on, so that they can get used to their life as a, as a working dog in the future. So what's the timeline if you're, you've got a year and then how long will you keep monitoring progress? For the duration of the trial, which should be finishing in June 2022. <coughs> so it's a four year trial, it began in June of last year. So, so Kelly, you were a potential end user of a puppy, uh, one of these puppies potentially in the Latrobe study. Tell us a little bit about your history. You've been deployed no less than eight times. Yes, that's right. Yeah, I was uh, in the army from 17 years of age and I was very much uh, focused on uh, service to the country, altruistic values as most people do in, in defence uh, and deployed uh, to many different war zones and uh, Basically, it was described as cumulative trauma when I had a breakdown in 2015. And there were certainly some signs that it was, uh, that it was coming on. I just viewed it as operational stress and fatigue. Uh, but uh, it was really a, a, a quite a hard moment where uh, I was just watching television and uh, something triggered and uh, it was like the blue screen of death in my head. Mm -hmm. And uh, things have not been the same since. I, w I was hospitalised for a long time after that particular event and deteriorated significantly within a three week period, complicated by the fact that I was pregnant with my second child uh, and a husband who had a, a very busy job. And, you know, we were living in Wagga Wagga at the time with no family support. Um, so, yeah, it was a really challenging time. So tell us the, I suppose, the ongoing lived experience of living with PTSD. What does it mean for you and the people around you? Yeah, sure. Look, uh, living with PTSD, some days are good, uh, most days are challenging, and some days are terrifying. And I say that in the context that I am three years down the recovery path now, and that each veteran who experiences PTSD does experience it slightly differently. But there are some common factors, and those common factors usually surround, uh, uh, include depression. So, you know, on a, on a bad day, my biggest challenge is getting out of bed. Uh, the, the inability to control emotions. So, you know, when you're in the military, you're trained to be a tough person because you are going to see some things that are not nice. So you really do suppress your emotions, and so now, uh, trying to deal with the emotional reaction to my experiences is quite a challenge. Uh, also, anxiety, you know, the hypervigilance, constantly checking doors. Uh, I always drive with my car doors locked. Um, and panic attacks just uh, in innocuous environments. So loud noises, uh, crowded spaces where there is just so much going on that you cannot determine where the threat is coming from can be very overwhelming uh, very, very quickly uh, with very few uh, uh, symptoms to identify that that's going to happen. And of course there's the other things as well like your, your tremors, your stuttering, uh, 
uh, the impacts on your short-term memory uh, and the distortion and loss of your long-term memory as well. So it is different every day and I'm sure that if you ask my husband the same question, he would say it's challenging, unpredictable and at times isolating. As I said, you, you, well, you don't have a dog at the moment, but your niece has an assistance dog. Tell us how you, how you find that when she brings the dog around. So I have a beautiful niece called Quinn. She's five and she was diagnosed with autism when she was two. She's in Bendigo. Uh, and Quinn was uh, experiencing difficulties with communication. Uh, so they decided to get a beautiful Labrador called Harley. Now Harley is not a certified um, assistance dog, but she is very much just adapted into that role to the point where when uh, Quinn is um, struggling with her behaviour, Harley will just go up to the dog and just, uh, will just go up to Quinn and just sit next to her and is completely uh, relaxing. So we love Harley when she comes over to our, to our house. I have three children and my youngest tries to ride Harley like a horse. And, and Harley uh, loves that to have and, it. And Harley loves it, yeah. So uh, we don't have a dog at the moment but we look forward to getting a cedar puppy on the 5th of August. It's just been a very to be a trainer <laughs> for, a, for a seeing eye puppy. But you, you said to me that, that when, when Harley's around that helps you too. Oh it certainly does and I can't explain uh, the scientific reason why why that is but uh, for someone with PTSD having a dog gives you a level of security that you just cannot seem to find any other way. Uh, it's challenging going to a supermarket and having to line up with people in front and behind you because you can't see them. So having a dog there can really just take away that stress. Mia, if I can bring you in here, when you, when you hear about these dogs and, and Kevin's dogs and the dogs in this, in this study, what comes to your mind? What, what do you think is one of the biggest issues with assistance animals? Look, I think um, just as our community is, I guess, raising the importance of animal welfare in all contexts, and you know, examples of that might be seeing zoos redefine themselves as conservation harbours rather than just a good day out. We've seen the phase out of exotic animals in circuses in Australia. Um, I, I think just being mindful of the welfare experiences of dogs utilised in this way. Um, and there are some sectors of the community, and I, I, I wouldn't put myself in that sector, but I'm here to represent the ethics of these situations, that would say that to some degree um, dogs in this context are being constricted conscripted to these roles or to some degree exploited um, and even if that's done compassionately it's still compassioned exploitation so I guess just being really mindful of the fact that if we want to keep utilizing dogs in these ways and this extends to all the different ways that we utilize dogs in our communities whether it's with the police or the military or um, assistance and service dogs um, we need to be really mindful of being able to prove to the public that their welfare is assured and taken care of and we need to do that by using a strong evidence base of best practice across the full life cycle of the dog from the way that we breed them, the way that we raise them, the way that we train them, the way that we educate handlers, the way that they're housed and the way that we manage their retirement and endpoints of their working career um, to be able to assure the public that the social licence to operate, which is what we call that community approval for a practice, um, deserves to stay in place. And you actually did a, a PhD on, um, I had to really think about this, but then it, it was basic when I did think about it for a, a minute, enrichment for yeah, dogs yeah. that are in kennels. Now explain that. Yeah, so part of my PhD looked at human psychology aspects of working dog welfare. So looking at how do we perceive the welfare of these dogs and what do we think is important to their welfare. And then part of it looked at a composite uh, structured enrichment program within a kenneled environment of working dogs and looking at how... Um, I guess the dogs reacted coming from a puppy raising home into a training kennel facility and whether the enrichment program helped them cope better with that change of environment. And because it's not just a physical change of environment for the dogs, it's also a change of social context for them. So they're leaving behind, you know, having a transfer of that attachment of their person who's been their person. And that may be to kennel staff that they're transitioning before they end up with their final handler or to a dog trainer. 
Um, and also, uh, if they've had other dogs in the household and they're meeting other dogs when they're in a training situation, if they are housed in a central training kennel kind of context. And tell us what you mean by enrichment, what the sort of things... So it was looking at things like um, playing... So there's a lot of different elements of what we call enrichment, um, things like playing classical music, giving them lavender essence to smell, providing them with toys, uh, time to free run off lead in an open space, letting them play with each other, all these kind of things are different types of enrichment. Um, and they've been shown individually to help dogs cope better in kennels and what industry has responded by doing is going, great, we'll give them this and this and this and this and this, but no one had actually tested that kind of composite program to see if more was better and there's a risk that, you know, doing all those things might actually add to the stress of the dogs because we're keeping them so busy doing all the things. And, you know, it's, I guess, in a learning environment where you're wanting a dog to learn, you've got to try and get that perfect balance of um, training time, rest and downtime or sleep, and also playtime. And I guess that sort of, um, when we think about what's important to dogs, we'll probably think, oh, well, they're fed, they're, you know, they're in warmth and comfort, they've got their physical needs are met. But what we've learned a lot about in the scientific area in animal welfare over the last 15 years is also about the emotional needs of, of mammals like dogs. So they have rich emotional and social lives and we're allowed to talk about them now and use words like affective state and emotions and, and recognise that they have their own goals and desires and needs. And so I guess when I look at these dogs, you know, I, I just want to um, be reassured that they're getting those parts of their lives met, as well as getting fresh water and good food and somewhere warm to sleep at night. And I do, I want to discuss the whole issue of animal welfare much, in much more detail a little bit later, but if, Pauline, if I can bring you in here. We know from what Tiffany was saying that we don't know a lot scientifically, but you were, in fact, you, together with Tiffany, were involved in a report for the National Disability Insurance Agency uh, on assistance animals. Tell us a bit about what, what that found. Yeah, they, they wanted to know what the evidence was because people were asking them for funding for assistance dogs and they can't just give out funding for whatever people want. And the same with the D Department of Veteran Affairs in terms of funding assistance dogs. Which is veterans. why they're doing this so study. So why they're doing this study. So, so they're government organisations. They're not allowed to give money out without having a good reason to do that because otherwise the public would get cross about that. So uh, the NDIA wanted us to do a review basically, of what the research is out there, how much, how much has been proven to work, what sort of programs work, because uh, it's all very well, and, and the case studies are fantastic, and we're all completely in awe of what the dogs can do, but the fact that one dog can detect epilepsy in advance doesn't mean that they all do or they can't. So proof of concept, proof that any single dog in the whole universe can do that is amazing and really valuable, but then looking at the, the when and how and what sort of dogs and what sort of epilepsy and all that, looking at all those other things becomes important. So, so what we did was review the literature and it turns out there isn't very much. So it's very difficult to come up with a, an argument for government organisations to fund assistance dogs for all sorts of different disorders because there is no evidence. Now that's not to say it doesn't work but it's to say that the standard of proof, of, of scientific proof, is not at the level that is needed to be able to convince governments and other organisations to fund things. Partly that's just an issue of it's new, it's a new field, so everything takes a little bit of time. And, you know, it's not something you can't do a study in three weeks, it takes four years to look at what happens with these. But the other thing that, that's an issue is it's really difficult to do good, rigorous justifiable research and, and there's lots of reasons for that. One of, one of the reasons is you can't, dogs are not invisible. So if you wanted to, say we had a new drug that we thought... You can't was, have a placebo. So, <laughs> yeah, no, so you can't have, you can't give people a dog without them knowing that they've got a dog. So you can't have a control group. Right? And, and that's, for science, that, that's actually a, a significant problem. Could you give them an untrained dog though? You could, so, so that would be one way of doing it. Uh, another, a, a way that's working really quite effectively is a waiting list control where you have 40 people who are, all have the same disorder and they all really want a dog and you give 20 of them a trained dog and you tell the other 20, we'll get to you, give us a year and you'll get your dog, but you monitor both groups over that year. And some, some people have started doing that now and there's been a study come out of the US with PTSD dogs showing that the, the people who got the dogs were 
had a re reduction in symptoms compared to the people who were on the waiting list control. But even that, it's, uh, it's difficult to know whether it's the dogs that are having the effect or the fact that you've got a dog because you, your expectations are that the dog's going to help you. So it's not an unbiased test. It's, it's really difficult. The scientists really want it to work. The people who are in the program really want it to work. The dog providers really want it to work. And all of that argues against it being a convincing scientific experiment. But you know, if you get enough evidence, even if it's not the very best evidence you can get, if you get enough of it, then you can convince people. And you wouldn't say that uh, that there is enough already from some of those. I know that uh, there's been a number of studies in the US and Canada into PTSD in particular. And um, I can I can quote you a, a little bit from the American Psychological Association that says veterans benefit significantly from dog ownership in combination with a structured dog training program. Not only do they experience significant decrease in stress and post-traumatic stress symptoms, but they also experience less isolation and self-judgment. Um, is that, that's not enough? No, that's really, that's <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> that's, that's absolutely fantastic. And that quote came out how long ago? Uh, this year, I think. This yeah, year. Yeah. So it was after we started. So when we started this program, there was no evidence. And we're, so it really is a new it's field. It's really a new yeah. field. And we're talking to the people in the US and Canada, and we know that. And, and you know, there, there's also issues with the study. So there was one study in the US that had to be stopped because one of the dogs bit somebody. Now, that's not OK in anybody's language. So we need to be careful about what dogs we're using and who we're placing them with and where they're coming from. So the step one is proof of concept. Can one dog detect epilepsy? Can one dog help somebody with PTSD? And we're past that. We're all convinced that, that they can do that. Step two is, under what conditions does that happen? So it's not the case that you can give anybody any dog and magic will happen. You have to be a really structured program. You need to understand the, the mental health issues as well as the dog welfare issues. It's a really, really complicated partnership issue. And, and the, the, you, that's a very nice segue to where I wanted to go next. I mean, the idea of someone being bitten by a dog. Uh, Kevin, when you train your dogs, are you working under a national standard? Are you working towards a national certification? Do I know that when they're perfectly trained, they're bomb proof? Yes, as bomb-proof as, as you can possibly be, but they are still dogs. So we work to the best standards in Australia. Um, but are they national coordinated standards? Well, the national standard, the Commonwealth Law, Section 9 of the Discrimi Disability Discrimination Act, really doesn't impose any standards. It just says that you need the dog. Um, the dog must be uh, well behaved in public. And the dog must be able to assist you to alleviate the symptoms of your disability and allow you to get out. And that's the broadest possible um, definition. Uh, each state has then gone out and done their own bit. So in Victoria, we have the Victorian Transport Authority, which is uh, approving people. Um, South Australia has some people to approve people, to approve dogs. The, the most comprehensive is the Queensland one. And that's the one that we join because it is the most comprehensive and that's we work under their authority at the moment. And theirs is recognised all over Australia. So, so the second issue is not just, I suppose, the training of the dog, but it's this public access issue. This seems to be, am I right, in being key, that you have to, you can, as you said, Harley's not, not certified in a particular way. That must mean Harley can't go on a train or a plane. That's right. Right. So c can you explain the public access issue? Public access test is really just to show that the dog is well behaved at that moment and able to go in public. So she's not going to defecate um, on the floor, she's not going to bite anybody, she's going to ignore people, she won't be a nuisance, and um, that's a public access test. We need to go further than that and to show that the dog is indeed helping somebody in order to be a service dog, to be an assistance dog. So you need the public access test and the fact that the dog can help that person alleviate their disability. So, now, but, but that raises a huge can of worms because yes. I'm, I'm going to switch to you, Tiffany. How, how do you possibly, if, if I come along with my schnauzer and I say that schnauzer calms me down and makes me feel good? Yeah. Who's to say, well, no, you can't take your schnauzer onto the plane or the train or the, you know? Yeah, it's a, it's a really big problem. Yeah. So how do we solve it? <laughs> what do we need? Um, I think we need a national assistance dog accreditation scheme so that no matter where you get your dog trained, what the dog is trained to do, what sort of disability the dog is being trained to help with, there will be a single 
standard that is applied across the board to every dog and handler team. So that dogs, so that handlers and dogs that are trained by Kevin's organization and Assistance Dogs Australia, Guide Dogs Victoria, you name it, even people who choose to train their own assistance dog, which is perfectly legal, they need to make sure that the standard is even across all of those organizations, um, just to make, just to be sure that when you take the dog in public that it's not going to, to poo in the middle of the restaurant and, and that it won't bite another cafe patron. I personally think that veterans would want that too. And the reason for that is that uh, you don't want your dog to create any extra stress for you. So if you have that surety that they're well trained and that they're going to behave, then you just know that they're, they're going to be able to do their job really, really well. And one of the issues too is that people are denied access to spaces that they actually have the legal right to enter. So uh, it's very common. We, we've talked to several people who have had trouble going into the cafe or the restaurant because they're like, oh, you can't bring that dog in here. But it is a trained assistance dog, Kevin's dogs. You know, they get, they get denied access to spaces. But if there were a national accreditation scheme with, you know, say an ID badge that was had Australian government written on it or something, then, you know, that would make a much stronger case that actually this is really an assistance dog and I really do have the right to be here with my dog. There's one issue with this, and it's, 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 it's a glaring issue. Only one? Yeah. No, no, there's one major issue with it. Firstly, the public access test also, and the, disability, the, um, the standards also going to the welfare of the dog and how the dog's looked after and all the rest of it. But the issue is, and it's a big issue, is that this level of bureaucracy cannot be allowed to form a barrier of discrimination. And that's what happens today. So you've got a few trainers that are approved, people similar to us, and somebody desperately needs a dog and has maybe trained the dog themselves to help them pick something up off the floor, would approach us and, uh, and ask us to certify their dog. There's a huge cost involved in that. So we need this process, this national uh, standard, which I agree with, and it needs to be an all-embracing standard, needs to be done in a way that it's not discriminatory. Similar maybe to a car license or a driving license or something of that nature. So it's not out of somebody's ability to afford it or it restricts people from going out. But I suppose the, the difference is, Pauline, if I can put this to you, with a driver's license there is a set of hard and fast quantifiable rules that one needs to know and skills one needs to have. How do you make a standard when these dogs are doing so many different things? I think we can and I think because we can go for a, a, a minimum level. So the dog has to be safe in public. That's just a no-brainer. The dog has to be safe. It, it can't be a dog that's going to bite people or annoy them or jump up on them. Or you know, It has to be safe. And, Does and that we, mean that we, I have to keep my children at home? Yes. So there, there is an issue with children. No yes. riding the dog. Yes. Yes. No. Yes. So, so safety, public safety. So the public access test is a good one. In a, for, in a form that we can use it. So they have to be safe. And the other thing is the handler has to have a disability. So it's not the case that you, with your schnauzer, can call that an assistance dog unless you have some kind of documented disability that we all agree is a disability. So it, and you know, that's hard. That, that's a hard question because, you know, lots of people are anxious, lots of people are uh, unhappy and they call themselves depressed and then they say, well, the dog helps me with that, so therefore it's assistance dog. And who are we to say, no, actually, your depression is not real, but yours is. So you get to say you, you have a disability and you don't. But, but, you know, mental health professionals, that's what they do. So I think that they, they need to be the two things. You have to have a disability and the dog needs to be safe. And then within that, it can do all sorts of things. So you might have a, you know, a guide dog that, whose job is to guide a person with vision impairment or you might have a PTSD dog who does something completely different. And in Kevin's case, when you're training dogs to work with people who have cognitive or emotional disabilities, they often can't give the dog commands. So you can't say, you know, ask your dog to sit and that's the test. If you can't make your dog sit, you can't have the dog because it, it's... I don't think that's the level of control that we need to have, but they do need to be safe in public. And it is doable, you think, even across the whole yes. range of uses? And, yes. And it needs to go further. It needs to look at the handler. Is the handler able to handle the dog? And is the handler able to care for the dog? Or is the handler's environment able to correctly care for the dog? Because if the dog's not correctly cared for, firstly, it's just not great, but also the dog's not going to work. So it's, uh, it's a lose-lose situation. We need to know that those uh, 
that the whole gambit of concerns is covered by the test. Mm. Let's have a look a little now, Mia, at that whole idea of the care for the dog uh, factor. I mean, I was looking up the legislation regarding you know, mm -hmm. caring for pets. Do you and have fun there? Yeah, it's, well, it's actually <laughs> remarkable that it's very much based in the realm of cruelty to animals. So it's really yeah. at that that end of the spectrum as opposed yeah. to general welfare. Yeah, and look, in Australia it's, it's really tricky too because animal welfare is governed at a state level. So throughout the country there's a lot of variation. Um, and even within certain states there are, uh, you know, some areas where there are exemptions to the requirements that are there. So, for example, looking outside of this sector of dogs, if we were looking in Queensland um, and you had a livestock herding dog on your farm, it's exempt from the breeding and registration requirements that every other dog in the state is, but your dog that you use for pig hunting is not exempt. So there's a lot of inconsistencies. And, and when we look at like running things like kennel facilities, um, you know, within Victoria, if organisations like Seeing Eye Dogs Australia or Guide Dogs Victoria are members of the International Guide Dog Federation, then they're exempt from the same um, standards that apply to commercial training or commercial breeding facilities. Uh, and that's because the International Guide Dog Federation has its own auditing process every five years and has its own standards in place. But in terms of um, the community getting assurance that legislation has the back of these guys, it's, it's really not there. And like you say, the, the legislation that is there is focused on prevention of cruelty rather than, um, I guess, again, some states have, do it better than others, so there is generally a minimum required standard or suggested standard. They're generally not enforceable, so they are recommendations. And then they may also have a, a best practice recommendation where they say, you know, this is what you really need to do and this is what you should be doing. Mm. Um, but I, I guess it, no, no matter what's on paper, it also it, it becomes an enforcing situation and a checking situation. I mean, if, if, if someone's being ill-treated, you know, they can speak up, but a dog can't. So particularly, how you... Yeah, particularly when um, a lot of these dogs are housed, you know, they may be doing work in the public eye, but a lot of where their life is happening is happening in private. It's not necessarily happening in the public eye or where it can be readily policed without massive resourcing. Mm. Uh, yeah. Tiffany, how, how uh, important is welfare of dog to successful outcome? Oh, it's absolutely vital, I think. Uh, the, the very limited evidence that we have found in the scientific literature about the welfare of assistance dogs, and when I say very limited, I'm talking about exactly two studies. So we're not doing good enough as researchers. We have to do better. But what uh, the, the evidence that I have found has shown that if the dog is not being cared for properly, their ability to do their job well just goes down. And that's certainly so. backed up with evidence from the military, police, right. and other areas where they're, they're, again, still very limited numbers that have been looked at. But when they look at things like training methodology, you know, if you're using um, methods of compulsion, if you're using punishment techniques, um, you may get the result, like you may get the dog to an operational standard, but you're going to have a dog that's more fearful, is less longevity within the role as well um, and is less likely to do its best. So we know that there are definite um, connections between welfare and their capacity in performing in the role. You don't look very happy. No, 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 sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry. No, I'm, I'm very happy. No, it's, um, do, you, do you think that we need, we actually need, we need a driver's licence for the dogs, we also need a driver's licence for the people who have them to ensure that their welfare... I guess what I was thinking is that um, that mostly the assistance dogs have good welfare because their working life depends on it. I worry about all the non-assistance, so people's pets. Uh, mm. and, and in my life, I really worry about the welfare of people's pets because, the, you know, for me, the worst thing that you can do to a dog is keep it isolated with nothing to do. So I think that these dogs often have really good welfare because they have got a job to do. They can go places, they can do things. Dogs have been bred for, for thousands of years to want to do stuff, and to want to herd sheep, to want to hunt, to want to be with people and have that really close relationship with them. So for me, the welfare, yes, it's very important, but I think everybody in the field knows that it's important and pays attention to it, whereas in the other industries and in pets, that's not we so don't. much. Okay. But that, that said, we know that pet um, or owners of um, dog companions you know, are not necessarily the experts at reading their behaviour. Oh, they tend true. to miss a lot of the early signs of stress that dogs exhibit. So as a result of that, they tend to overestimate the welfare of their dogs. Um, these guys, so research that I've done has shown that the general community 
places the welfare, the perceived welfare of, of service and assistance dogs very highly um, when compared to things like the average pet dog or a stray dog or even something like a wild dingo. And yet in a lot of ways, you know, a wild dingo has got a lot more behavioural, environmental, social freedom than these dogs. I so, guess but we're also almost getting into, uh, um, is, it, is it, I don't know how to uh, describe the discussion, but, you know, what a dog wants. We don't know what a dog really wants. We don't know what it needs well, beyond we can, the shelter. There, there's the ways we can, the... we can find that out. And one of those ways is giving them choices and giving them an option. So they have a, a way to opt out. You know, if this dog... It's had enough of this, can it go yeah. and, is there a quiet room where it can go and have some time out from those duties well, and take a break? Yeah. Where's Sorry. its crate? Every one of our dogs yeah. has a crate yeah. for that exact reason. And it goes in when it yes. wants to? Yes. So when it wants to, it wants to if say... If it doesn't, she's not working, she goes into her crate and that's where she chills out. It's, uh, it's far more, in our area, it's far more definite because as Pauline said, our folks aren't always cognitively able to give commands, so we only work on instinct. So we're actually looking for what the dog wants to do as opposed to what the dog is being trained to do. We don't, we'll never train a dog against her instincts. So we'd ne never use a dog, if the instinct is to hunt for instance, we would never use that dog because you'd have to train it against her instincts and train quite hard to move against her instinct. Yes, you can, but in our instances can't. And in fact, I could just, just slide aside, but you said her, you only train female dogs. Yes, we do. Why, Kevin? Because <laughs> 2019. <laughs> <laughs> no, we've, we've only trained dogs for many, many years, and this is after Yarif, who's our head trainer, is the head honcho here, and understands this. He feels that they're far more compassionate and they're far more concentrating on the. I'm not sure it's correct, but. Ali, we need to make that's that's true of Kevin's, Kevin's organisation. Not that's all. not true yeah. of, yeah. of all dogs. So, so okay, uh, sorry. Yeah, the boys are great too. Yeah, good, excellent. <laughs> yeah. um, but I was going to ask you, you, particularly with your seizure dogs, yes. uh, who are constantly on alert and have to be. Yes. How do you rest them? And I'm, I'm thinking of the the you have a young girl in Queensland who has yes. one, who and that. Dog, I'm sorry if my questions are boring you. Um, <laughs> so how, how do you rest that dog? That dog has to go on holiday, so she goes away for a weekend. Um, she gets specific play time every single day. So away from the, her handler? Her handler is doing the play with oh, her. Oh, right, okay. The handler lives with her. She doesn't have seizures every minute of every day. So she's actually throwing the frisbee to her, and she's uh, running around with her and walking with her and all the rest of it. When we want the dog to rest completely, the dog goes into her crate, and she has specific fence time and specific crate time. But more importantly, she actually has weekends away from her handler, where she goes to a different place where she's relaxed, where she knows what's going on, and she's allowed to just lie on the back with her paws in the air. If we don't do that, she won't do her job. She will get stale, and she won't recognize the seizure when it comes. So we're very, very aware, and uh, that's what we spoke about. So we're very aware that the dog is uh, relaxed and happy to be there. The dog must want to work. If she doesn't want to work, she's not going to work. Do you want to go walking? Yeah. yeah. We don't want to hold her up if she wants to go out. Yeah. <laughs> she should learn she gets what she wants at all yeah. stages. <laughs> but I think all the dogs do get what they want because if they don't get what they want in our environment, which is not a forced environment, they just won't work. Won't work. Kelly, if you, if you were, to, well, when you get your dog, how important will it be to you to actually have some guidelines as to how to look after it? Because particularly if you're training a dog or if it's a working dog, the guidelines are obviously going to be slightly harsher than a, a pet dog that can hop on the couch whenever it wants to. Oh, uh, look, I'm a military person, so I'm just used to doing as I'm told. <laughs> uh, so I'll just follow the rules pretty much from seeing Will it be your first dog that you've owned? Uh, no, had yeah. uh, dogs as, as a yeah. young child. Uh, but quite yeah, often for people it is their first experience of dog good. ownership. And so we heard, we, we heard yeah. a talk from a PhD student, one of my other students, and she's in the audience somewhere, but she's just spent three years tracking people who were getting assistance dogs. And she found that it was a really big transition for them. So suddenly you go from not having a dog to having a dog, and that means you have to get out of bed in the morning because you've got to take the dog out. You have to, you know change the routine of your life and and for the people that she worked with some of them that was a really hard thing to do and so supporting them through that particularly if they've never had a pet dog in the house before it, it's a big jump mm. and, and we do need to help them 
So Kelly, how are you approved? What do you have to, to, to do? You have to show your house. Do you have to prove that yeah, you can? Yeah, indeed. We we have to go through quite a detailed process, actually. And I'm really glad that we had to go through that process because I think that you want the right people to be looking after these dogs. So uh, you know, it included a national police check. Uh, you had to have a working with children's check. Uh, we had to have our house surveyed. Uh, a whole bunch of things, and uh, including the interview as well. She came over and checked out the kids to make sure that they were going we're to be ride the dog okay. <laughs> going to ride the dog. Uh, yeah, so look, it was actually a long process. I think it took about uh, three months to, to finally get that approval. Yeah. I'm going to open this up to the floor for questions in just a minute, but just before I do that, I was going to preempt one that you may ask. I wanted to, Kevin, would you ever train someone's pet? Um, it depends on it's how long is a piece of string. If that person doesn't have a psychological challenge or doesn't suffer from anxiety or something of that nature, then we may well look at it. It would be very difficult and in most cases it probably wouldn't work. If they've had any psychological challenges like anxiety, uh, panic, um, seizures or some, things of that nature, we wouldn't because the dog in all likelihood would have been influenced by them. If you've got PTSD and you're afraid to go somewhere, your dog will learn from you not to go to that place. So it becomes a vicious circle. You feed on the dog and the dog feeds on you. That's why for that first year it's so, it's so important that the dog is just loved and taken everywhere in a very secure environment and very secure, um, by very secure people so that she's happy to go into all those areas afterwards and can go with you even if you are anxious. But generally, it, it, again, it depends on why the, you know, why the person needs a dog as to whether we would do it or not. But, but it, that raises another question. I mean, you take these dogs everywhere in their first year, um, but you know, you know the, the provenance of these dogs, if you like. You know where they've been at all times. Yes. And is that an issue? Because dogs, dogs are, I mean, they're, they are animals, even though we sometimes forget that. And you need to know that they're not going to go into a situation that they've been spooked by in the past or something we, like that. We hope that every one of the situations that they're going to, and they go through a very formal process, there's a list of um, items that they've got to tick off, where they've got to go, how they've got to go. And whenever they go into one of these areas, they've done, it's done with, with mindfulness that the experience is positive for the dog. There, there, there should be no reason why a dog doesn't love to go to a shopping centre if she's not afraid by a lot of people. So do it a few times, make it a great experience for her, and then she's happy to do it. Let her walk around the campus for a year and be loved by people, and then she's going to love people. She's used to other dogs, and uh, it's absolutely critical in the first year that the dog grows up fearless, um, very secure, and um, exposed to as many new environments and stimuli as possible in a positive way. Even their beginning, these dogs, they left their families at eight weeks, but they weren't separated from their brothers and sisters, or from their sisters. They moved together as a pack for the first four weeks of their training, until they were mature enough to be separated. You know, every point we can take to try and make the dog more secure, that's what we'll do that. But um, again, they're dogs. They're also before the eight weeks, so we know with dogs that there's a critical period for development of social when is that? Starts before they leave their breeder's home. So they, they're born blind and deaf. They don't really experience much. But even then, you know, they're, they're, they have a relationship with their mother and their breeder if their breeder's spending time with them. But then the critical period starts a little bit after that, but it starts before they leave their breeder's home. So if you're just taking any dog that's been brought up in any... You know, if we're talking about puppy farms where there's 300 dogs in a shed they're not getting the sort of experiences that they need to have early to become really good assistance dogs. That, having said that though, there are organisations and individual people who are rescuing dogs from shelters or from people who don't want them anymore and training them as assistance dogs. And in some cases that works perfectly well, you know, because some, there are dogs in shelters, there are unwanted dogs who are fantastic dogs and you can build on that and turn them into something that's really you know, wonderful, and then that has the benefit of the person who's training them also gets real benefits out of doing good things for the community. So there was a study in the US again where they had veterans who were spent a year training dogs from a shelter to be good companion dogs, and that's really improved their symptoms of PTSD as well, just that being in the community and doing things. And there's prison programs where prisoners are raising dogs and rehabilitating shelter dogs, and all of that can be really helpful 
but it, the risk is that you don't know the background of those dogs. So some of them, and if you're a good judge of dogs, if you know dogs well, you can, you're can pretty good at saying this one's going to be safe and this one's okay. But it, there is a danger with people who are not so experienced taking dogs from shelter, from rescue, and training them as assistance dogs and then giving them to really vulnerable people and you know things can just go horribly wrong and we don't want that to happen so the quality control the selection of the dogs the raising of the dogs from ground zero is really important and that's what in our study we know these dogs from the second that they're born mm. right? and do we you follow that Tiffany let me ask you do you think though that we tend to trust dogs too much oh that's a, that's an interesting question do we trust dogs too much? Maybe. Do you mean like that we just assume that they'll always be, behave they'll themselves? Be okay. Yeah, that yeah, we probably do. Yeah. Mm. I mean, as Kevin was saying, it's it's an animal, it's a dog at the end of the day, and you do everything that you can to make sure that it's gonna be, you know, well behaved, it's not gonna bite anybody or things of that nature. But at the end of the day, it's it's a dog. We we you know, they're unpredictable in the sense that you know, in, in the way that we all are, sometimes we just do things that are out of character, and dogs do as well. So that risk is always there. So, having said that, you know, I've had pet dogs that I would have always that I would trust, at least in in the environments where I know that they're predictable. Uh, you know, I would never have assumed that my pet dog would have bitten me, for example. Um, so, so I did trust her in that sense. But yeah, we probably do. I don't know that, that we can stop that, though. I think mean, it might just no. be in our nature. But, they deserve yeah. it, though. Dogs, are, you know, really good dogs are fantastic, and they, I think they are predictable. I would feel more comfortable predicting a dog's behaviour than a person's behaviour. Because yeah. I think they're yeah. quite yeah. I think they do amazingly good yeah. what we put on them, what we yeah. submit them to and what we ask of them. Absolutely. They're very honest. They're very authentic. Yeah. If a dog's going to bite you, you're going to know about it. You know, mm. you, you, it's, not a, it's not a secret backstabbing... It, it's, <laughs> the dog's angry. Uh, <laughs> I know, straight for you. <laughs> trusting their lives to the dog. Yes. Yeah. You know, yeah. somebody's having a seizure and they're completely helpless, and the dog's looking after them, and they're trusting them to the dog. And uh, so, yes, we do trust and them. And they can, yes. and, and it works. And, and it, all of you who have got pets, you do know your dogs, and you know whether they're safe or not. And some of them aren't, and you choose to love them anyway. Mm. But you do get a good sense of which dogs are good at what. What would be really great is to get an evidence base on the dog side of this equation mm. and to get some research where funding isn't just tied to human health outcomes, where we can actually get funding to look at the dog side of it and you know, put some focus there to be able to look and track whether it's their physiology or behaviour or both and look at where the situation does break down, were there signs earlier on, like was that dog going from a state of acute stress to chronic stress and then, you know, it just hit breaking point where the kid wrote it and it bit, you know, like it, we can work out what optimises this relationship and this effect and then set it up so that it's more successful more of the time. While we're just studying the human health outcomes, and I don't mean to belittle them at all because they're very valid and very real, we're only looking at half of the equation. Right. Let me open this to the floor for questions. Um, we do have, okay, we've got some a roving mic. Just start at the back and then I'll move across. My name's Sez. Thanks to everyone who's already uh, on the panel tonight. Um, I find it very uh, interesting. I've got two reflections. One reflection is uh, my background. I grew up with complex PTSD as a child and um, I'm a social worker and um, I'm really interested um, in uh, there being um, more research for um, animals that aren't um, aren't certified, because obviously there's, um, for my, my experience, that was an experience, and there's obviously um, such specific criteria that needs to um, be involved that it's uh, it impacts on a limited amount of people. So there's going to be a lot of people in the audience here even that have um, companion animals that are therapeutic and um, I'm really interested in those narratives coming through in research to complement, um, to not to negate um, or belittle the research that's happening here. Um, and um, also just to, to make comment that um, the law in general um, sees animals as property and that's a big structural issue 
that I think underlies policy and um, law that needs to change um, in the context of keeping animals in mind. Let me, uh, Pauline, I'll put that to you because we were talking about how if you're going to have a licensing system, you want it to cover everything and you do want it to be for some dogs that will just be companion animals as opposed to highly trained assistance animals. Yeah, I think that's something that we've kind of lost track of a little bit and, and because the assistance dog area is really growing and booming and people are very interested in it. It's on the newspapers, it's on the radio all the time. We're doing a panel on it and people are getting very excited about it and everybody wants an assistance dog. But for 90% of people, having a well-trained, quiet, sensible companion dog is good enough. It will, they will have lots of benefits from that. They don't need the dog to go out to shopping centres with them. They just need it at home being a well-trained companion dog and I think you're, you're absolutely right. We need much more research about the benefits that we can get just from having that. We need the money yeah. for the research. We need the money for but the research. Mia, the, the, the other issue, the, 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 um, the property issue, I mean, how do you get around that? Because fundamentally, they are. <laughs> the property, the mm. fact that they're treated as, as mm. property. In the law. I don't know how you get around it. Again, I think... Um, I guess that perhaps as we get more scientific understanding of not just how to prevent cruelty but how to optimise well-being in animals, um, we may see a change in the law. I mean, certainly animal law is a growing field around the world and it's being questioned all the time. We've had the acknowledgement of animal sentience in recent years. We've had... Um, you know, some countries have acknowledged some species of animals as being, um, oh, what's the term? Like non-human people, is it? Yeah, persons. Yeah, non-human persons. persons. Yeah. So they've acknowledged that, is it elephants? I want to say it's elephants. I think it's elephants. Um, <laughs> have been acknowledged as being non-human persons. So that changes then how their law recognises them. And this change, I think, the way our community is prioritising animal welfare now, and we're seeing this over the last 20 years to now, we'll see it again over the next 20 years as we go, it's going to become more of an important issue in our society. I have to say, I think that's a whole other bold thinking serious thing if there's <laughs> animals as sentience. Okay, let's, let's take a question from, we had a hand up over there. Good evening, and thank you very much for the presentation so far. First of all, I wholeheartedly agree with um, the notion that we need to have a standardised certification process. I look forward to that day. Uh, secondly, my question is probably perhaps for Mia, but for the, for the whole panel. Um, we understand that certification occurs, but in terms of the training, the training methods for the dogs when they do become certified or in order to get them certified, whether they be assistants or therapy dogs, I've just recently gone through the training process with my dog to become a therapy dog. It took some time to find out um, where the best, in my opinion, um, training organisations were and which organisations did not use aversive processes for training. So if you could talk to that a little bit, So, please. so Thank basically you. national standards for the training process as opposed to just the certification. Well, you've just hit on a massive issue in how we train dogs within Australia. There are no standardised requirements for dog trainers. There's definitely programs of education that people can do and say, I have learnt through this way, I have done these courses. Um, but you can just as easily be someone who said, oh, I've been training dogs for 30 years, I know dogs, I grew up with dogs. But, um, but that's different for seeing eye dogs, I assume, because Kelly's part of quite a formalised process for those dogs. For, but, yeah, I guess. So within certain organisations, they will have their own internal processes, um, both for training their staff that are training the dogs and for the staff that are training the, the future handlers. Sometimes that's different teams. So some uh, organisations will have teams focused on people and how we educate the people to look after the dogs and others will have teams where they're focused just on doing the dog training and then they hand over the dog to the people who work with the people. If that makes sense, it's getting a bit convoluted. Other organisations will have the one teams working with everybody and they do the dog training and they work with the handlers. Right. So, so, so should, uh, Tiffany, should a national, if we have a, a national driver's licence type scheme for the certification of dogs, should there also be national... Uh, certification standards for how they are trained, the methods used. I think it's something we should seriously consider. I think it would be uh, 
potentially an important component of any certification I process? think from the point of view from like putting on a um, completely non-emotive managerial or project management or whatever you want to call it viewpoint, it's a risk management strategy for the sustainability of using dogs like this. If you can assure the general public that they have been trained using evidence-based best practice and that that doesn't involve compulsion or aversive um, needs or means, then the community is going to be much more likely to support the ongoing use of dogs in this way. But, mm -hmm. but you want evidence-based training. We are really short on evidence. So there is some evidence about animal training. You know, that people have been training animals for a long time. But in terms of different methods of training mm. dogs, mm, and, who knows what works? And I'd be very hesitant to prescribe a methodology of training. I can, you can prescribe what you're not allowed to do. You can't use a prong collar. You can't uh, hurt the dog. You can't abuse the dog. But different people have different training methodologies. We work with instincts to a very large extent. It's different to other people. So I think the methodology is difficult to certify, but the outcomes can be certified. And you can certainly be very clear on what you can't do. Correct. But yes. perhaps more so than even those extreme things, I guess. Yes. Yeah. But I guess with the certification process, too, you have to consider the enforceability of it. Absolutely. So how can you even yeah. tell, you know, if, if somebody says, yeah, yeah, I only used uh, reward-based training, but they go home and they're, you know, whipping yeah. their dog every night. How do you know? You only you know? have to look at um, the racing greyhound industry yeah. for clear examples on well, the horse what goes industry. on behind closed doors. Yeah. And they're one of the most regulated um, uses of dogs in our community. But on so. that point, I guess, Kevin, have you ever removed a dog from a, from a, uh, a client? Our, our uh, model doesn't allow us to do that because we're not a charity and the, the dog actually becomes the ownership of the participant once the participant has passed the required tests to get the dog. What they do after that, we monitor the dog on a regular basis, on a very regular basis. If we're not comfortable with what the owner's doing, we obviously discuss it and tell them, but we just won't recertify that dog. Now that owner can keep the dog forever as a pet. The, the dog belongs to them, they've purchased the dog. Um, if the program didn't work as we wanted it to with them, then that program doesn't work. We take a decision prior to giving the dog to somebody that um, they're okay with the dog. Now that's after working with the participant for at least one year, and in most cases a year and a half. And not just working with the participant, but working with the participant and the entire support team. So nine or 99 times out of 100, we know the entire environment and we're comfortable that they're going to support the dog. And it's cost them an awful lot of money and they're very committed. How much does it cost them? It can range from 30 to 40, 45,000 dollars. It depends on the complexity of, of what we're doing and how long that's going to take them. Um, but once we've got that, once they've, they've got their dog, that dog becomes an essential part of their life. They're not going to mistreat that dog. They're not going to, simply because without that dog, they're not going to be empowered. They're not going to be able to go out. So the dog becomes an essential thing. It's, it's part of how they live. I guess in some ways, though, your, your dogs are at that extreme end. They're not, you know, they're not at the lower level they, of assistance They, they are, but we have the same issues that other people have. And uh, we try and get around it by saying, yes, you've got to have a support mechanism in place. And it's not always malicious. Like, you know, I've seen working dogs incredibly obese because mm. they're only like yeah. walking down to, you know, the local hangout and people fed their dog hot chips every Friday, like, you know, and they ended up with bad dental disease. Like, you know, there, there are welfare issues that come about that are not through malicious mistreatment. Sure. They're just yes, and, things that can happen. And that's what we try yeah. and train people for in the two yeah. and a half years of the program. Yeah. So they'll only, eat, for instance, eat one brand of food. And it's a good brand of food. It's what we've judged to be a great brand of food. Their treats would only be carrots, for instance, because we work with humans and children who don't have the cognitive ability, so they're going to share the dog's food, and carrots are a good thing for everybody. She's good dreaming. evening. <laughs> she's having a bit of a dream. She's having a bad dream, yeah. or a good dream. No, no, it she's was chasing through the word. Yeah. 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 Is it carrots? Yeah, the carrots? What's that? Yeah. <laughs> she knows well what a carrot is. Yeah, did she need a word? Maybe that's what it was. Yeah. So, so um, yes, we, we try and address that, and it's a huge yeah. issue. And very quickly, the dog can become a beast. The, the, the one dog that was, that was on the television, old Baloo, she started to get a little bit overweight because one of her rewards for a seizure was cheese. So that was really nice, except the young girl has 10 seizures a day and 
So now she's getting something else. <laughs> <laughs> and re regular checks are so important for yes. that point of view. And because people's lives, you know, things can happen. Maybe they have kids, maybe they have medical issues, maybe they have other things that happen. And looking after the dog is one of the things that, that slips. I mean, I'm, I'm a mum of two kids. I've, my okay. dog spends a lot of the time on the couch, but there's probably things that he would like that I'm not doing right now because I've got all this other stuff going but on. But that's why for us, the support mechanism is so important. It's so important. Yeah. Yeah. Let's take this question over here. Oh, thank you. Um, Kay Hargroves, I'm a, an experienced dog trainer. I've been working in these fields for many years. I have a lot of evidence which is anecdotal, but I love those words evidence-based. So, yeah, Pauline, bring it on, please. And I love the way you're putting ethics first. That's really important. Um, I wanted to add specifically, um, I'm now a member of what's called an industry review committee, which is a panel of people who volunteer on um, looking at the um, uh, vocational training programs. So we have in Australia companion animal services, animal studies and so on that are taught through TAFEs and private training providers. The role of my committee is to review those courses in relation to the animal, people who are working with animals, including dog trainers. One of the things that we're, we have been asked to look at over the next couple of years, and unfortunately the wheels of bureaucracy move very slowly, is whether there is need for a new course that would be teaching the skills and competencies that people need who are going to be working with you know, training assistants, therapy Can and various I, other dogs. So that's the question. Do we need that? Do we need a separate course? Um, what we have now is a course for pet dog training. I think people need to have certain competencies for pet dog training, but I think we also need a more advanced course that says, well, you know, your specialty is assistance dog training or your specialty is the transition of greyhounds to the community. Let's put that, let's put that to the panel. So yep. do, that sounds like a really terrific yep. so initiative. Yeah, yeah, so thanks, Kay. So we have thought about this and overseas you can do a master's level course in animal assisted therapy and learn to be uh, an expert in delivering that. Um, one of the things that we have to think about, I think, is it's not just the dog training. So, we, so yes, we have fantastic dog trainers, but we're dealing with people who have significant mental health issues. We need health professionals in there as well. And that's one of the things I really like about Kevin's organisation is he has a psychologist who runs the programs, and I think that's absolutely critical. It doesn't need to be a psychologist. might be an OT. might be you know, some other allied health. But we've thought about doing a master's level course at La Trobe that would train health practitioners uh, rather than the dog training side of things, because that's not that's not my thing, that's someone else's thing, but the, the mental health professionals to work with the programs and do the therapy. And, and I think that would be amazing, but I've not been able to get any traction on that yet. But the so recognition the that different types of training has different needs is yes. obviously absolutely key. Yeah. And we've got a question down here, and then I'll, then I'll move it there. Can I just ask you, just ask a question as opposed to a comment, otherwise we won't get through many more. Go for your life. Um, Kevin? It, the question to you was, can um, home pets uh, or companion pets at home be trained for assistance? And you said they it may not work because of the vicious cycle. How would you um, tackle this situation? How would you make this situation work? I'm not sure you can in all, in all cases. In all cases? In all cases, I think, um, in, in almost in the majority of cases for people with anxiety-related disorders or... Um, it, it's very difficult for the dog to have escaped being affected by an anxiety attack or a waking up with a nightmare and, and, and frightening the dog. And, and the dog, and you know from your own personal pets, the dog absorbs your emotion. Sometimes maybe too much and they can shake it off, but they, that stays with them. And uh, they learn from you what's positive and what's negative. And if something is negative, if going around a corner is negative for you every day, it's going to become negative for your dog every day. So does the concept then, when the person with PTSD, depression or anxiety, uh, has confidence in training their dog, the dog feels the person's uh, emotions that are calm or, or, or the calming effect, um, does that not create, instead of a vicious cycle, but a positive cycle? 
If you can remain calm, yes. Yes. But not, uh, I think if you're suffering with uh, PTSD mm. or an anxiety related um, challenge, you're not always able to remain calm. If you can remain calm whenever you're with a dog, then yes. But it's very unlikely. It's the same with someone with seizures. It's unlikely that they're always going to escape being around the dog. But it also, I guess, depends on what you're actually training a dog for. Correct, yes. I mean, if you're training a dog more as a, a, a assistance dog at a very low level versus a, or, a highly trained... Or if you're talking about an assistance dog to help you open a door, to pick something up which is as valid as anything else, then yes, there's, you should be able to because you're always cognitively able to reassure the dog about what's going on. But if you're not able to do that, that's when uh, it becomes more difficult. And um, very seldom are we able to bring those dogs back. It's, it's the same, very, you hear that a, a dog naturally alerts to a seizure. So if you've got an old dog in a family and the dog's been there for a while and then along comes a young child into that family and after two or three years that child starts to have seizures, that dog is strong enough by the time he sees, she sees the first seizure she may well react to that seizure in a positive way. And if you know how to bring that out to the dog and you can train the dog out of that, that dog can indeed hopefully become a seizure alert dog. If it's the other way around, that you have the seizures and then you bring a puppy into your house, it's going to be very difficult to do that because a puppy is going to go through a fear stage. Three fear stages, I'm told, and um, if it happens in any one of those stages, the puppy will become reactive. Take another question from this side. The dogs having time out, um, and I was thinking of dogs that um, are living with people with quite um, severe, um, like PTSD or depression, or um, are constantly on alert. And I'm just, and we're talking about um, dogs as being um, non, what is it, non-human people or non animals as non as people but non anyway just you, you know what I, mean. I, th I think kevin has actually answered that question I, mean, well, I, can, I can quickly answer yeah. again. and and it's to do with that um that that if dogs are, are constantly working it's like people you need time out and yep. i've just wondered if that becomes part of the um the within the the training of people that 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 is you know, an, an awareness so that the dog doesn't end up with a, an illness because yep. they're overworked. Yes, yes. It's, yep. it's, 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 we actually force them to let the dogs have vacations and um, in those cases it works very well. If we don't, then the dog's going to stop doing her job. And also each dog is trained from a very, very early age to be in a crate and to be comfortable and secure in the crate so that they can go there and switch off completely. During the day, if it's possible, our, our participant would go out with a human support and leave the dog behind. And generally they do it when they're going to a complex doctor's appointment or something of that nature, when they feel they need to, to, to be without the dog. Um, so that's generally how we manage it. And also the dogs are trained very extensively to, sh to shake off that stress. That's what we train them to do from an early age. How do you do that? We expose, it to, we expose the dog to that in a really positive environment and it becomes a fun. It, for, for a dog to alert for a seizure, for instance, she's learned to do it as part of her life, as part of her instinct and most importantly as part of a game. She loves to do it, she gets rewarded from doing it, she gets uh, well behaved. From, you know, so when she finds a, a seizure, she's really over the moon. The issue is when we have a she client... she gets <laughs> Yes, correct, she loves it. The issue is when we have a client who doesn't have a seizure for a while. The dog actually becomes you know, unhappy. So now we've got a fake seizure so the dog is stimulating again. <laughs> and happy, no, if, you, if you're doing a job and nothing happens for the job, you become unhappy. <laughs> you don't know what your, your purpose in life is. And uh, these dogs have a real purpose in life. They're enjoying themselves. All right, let's but take one, sorry. I was just gonna say, it would be really great to have objective records of what you're <laughs> reporting. So from the dog's point of view, you know, you believe that it is very helpful to them. It would be great to get the physiology or behaviour looked at objectively to back that up, to be able to say that it is habituation to the situation that's not a situation of learned helplessness. I, I would agree with you, accepting that the dog is doing her job without being forced to do her job. She's actually enjoying doing it. And if she wasn't enjoying it, she couldn't do it because there's no command telling the dog to watch me and alert for a seizure. No one's telling the dog to do that. Mm. She, you can't, it's not possible. The dog is doing it because the reward that comes afterwards is really exciting and she's enjoying doing that. 
And I think if, well, I know that when you take the alerting away from the dog, and she's been trained to do it and trained to watch for that change in behavior, she'll start to look for a different change in behavior so that she can alert and keep going. And we've got to be careful that she's focused just on seizures. And sometimes when people only have a seizure every two weeks, I know it sounds horrendous to everybody else, but for us, there's just not enough seizures. It's, uh, <laughs> I know it's terrible. I say to parents sometimes, uh, they phone me up and they want a dog and they say, Kevin, our, our daughter, our son is having a seizure once every month and what can we do? And I say, it's, you know, it's an uncontrolled seizure. And I say, I wish I can help you, but a seizure a month, we can't teach the dog to enjoy it because there's not enough enjoyment for the dog to do it. Mm. Uh, one question over here. We had uh, Congratulations on your work. It's very exciting. I just want to ask about the human subjects. Like, are, are, are they primarily um, veterans with combat history or does it include adverse childhood experiences or disaster type of trauma? Can I? You were talking, well, let's start so with the La Trobe the study. Actual, yeah. The actual project that we're doing at La Trobe is funded by the Department of Veterans Affairs, so it's only for veterans with PTSD. I don't think that it matters where the PTSD comes from. So a veteran who has other sorts of trauma that have led to PTSD, would, we would think about that. So, so, but in general, other people are doing things that are all sorts of different. We, we work with people suffering with PTSD from any source. It, it's, uh, the, the, the road to empowerment is the same in our eyes for everybody. We've got to get people to empowerment irrespective of what's stopping their empowerment. Obviously, each person with PTSD is very, very different, and uh, some are more complex than others, but uh, that road to empowerment, that journey to empowerment is what we're looking for, and, um, and that's why we have a team of, of health professionals to help us do this. And, and there is a queue of people, I think, waiting for a dog. Kelly, you know quite a few vets, don't you, who'd be quite... Yeah, absolutely, and certainly uh, Austin Hospital has a fantastic facility called Ward 17, where I have 20 beds for veterans and emergency services. And to, even just to try and get one of those beds is, is very, very challenging. But a lot of those veterans that go in there are also going through the process of applying for a, an assistance dog through all the various agencies that are out there. So they're highly sought after. Mm -hmm. And we'd be happy to do research on all sorts of stuff, but it comes down to money. You know, mm -hmm. It's just who, in, who is going to fund these right, studies? Right, out you go. And, and, um, yeah. and, so and we've been incredibly lucky to be funded by DVA yeah. to do this big... It's very expensive, it's very intense, it's, you know, it's, it's a big project. So we would love to do more of that mm -hmm. for all sorts of different things, but it's about finding... OK, very quickly, last question. So. Just uh, Ros Rhymes lived with Zest. I've got two um, therapy dogs, highly trained, with Lead the Way. My question speaks to the scalability and kind of the, because the theme is can dogs heal hearts and minds. Um, I'm curious, perhaps a question for Tiffany and Pauline in terms of what about visiting therapy dogs? I think of Zoo Therapy Quebec where they have a highly trained interventionist and a highly trained dog. So it's not the assistance model. However, it is a model, the yeah. therapy dog, yeah. therapeutic. It's I'm interested model. in your thoughts there, yeah. please. We'd love to do research on the therapy dog program, those kinds of uh, where, you know, there's a structured and goal-oriented intervention that is designed to meet specific goals um, for a particular uh, person. We'd love to do some of that. Again. Is that as poorly researched as, as sort of live in? <sighs> I'd say there's, there's, there are more studies out there looking at therapy dogs or therapy animals, because it's actually much, much broader than just dogs. There are still some limitations uh, that are common in the assistance dog literature as well, like, you know, small samples. The biggest limitation, in my opinion, in the therapy dog or therapy animal research is that while the, the benefits uh, are generally reported, so usually there is some sort of improvement, but the actual intervention itself is not very well described or it's not sort of standardized. So it's hard to know if what works really well for one therapist and her animal 
is whether that would generalize to other therapists with their animals. It's really, that's really sort of a big question mark around this type of, uh, around this research. But, but I agree, it's a really sort of fascinating idea, and I definitely think it deserves more attention. Again, it's the money thing. Yeah, yeah. And, and also I think the therapy, so I think we need to differentiate between therapy dogs and visiting dogs. So, so there's assistance animals, which is what we're talking about tonight, there's therapy animals, which are animals that work with a therapist, and that therapist needs to be a therapist. So it needs to be somebody with a health qualification of some kind, whatever that is. So speech pathologist, OT, psych, somebody who is doing goal-directed therapy, and they use a dog as part of that program. And then there's another level, which is the visiting dogs. So dogs that go to schools, dogs that go to hospital with volunteers. And that, that, so there's evidence around that being really beneficial as well. And again, not enough evidence to make, make crusty old scientists happy with it. There, there's, we need more, and we need more controlled studies. But yes, they're, they're, all three are amazing. It's, and sadly, we need the crusty old scientists on board, or else we can't get the money, can we? <laughs> so we, need, we need the crusty old politicians. They're even yeah. Yeah. But, but they're relying yeah. on the crusty old scientists. Yeah. That's the shame. Please join me in thanking our panel very much for their insights. Tiffany and Kelly, Pauline, Kevin and Mary. Now, Bold Thinking is going to be back on August the 15th. They're going to be joined by Australia's uh, Children's Laureate, uh, uh, Morris Gleitzman. He's looking at what is taboo in children's books, and guaranteed dogs are not taboo, um, and who gets to decide that. And uh, Morris is going to be in conversation with Latrobe's Professor Joe Lampert, State Library's uh, Children's Research Librarian, Dr Juliet O'Connor. And before that event, uh, there's going to be another Ideas in Society on July the 8th, looking at the issue of refugees uh, who arrive by boat and what Australia has done. This is Professor Robert Mann. He's going to be in conversation with Frank Brennan, Julian Burnside and Baruz Bouchani, who, of course, you probably know, is still on Manus Island and uh, wrote the book No Friend But the Mountains entirely by text message. And that book won the Victorian Prize for Literature this year. So that will be a wonderful conversation. I do hope that you can join us. Thank you very much for being here tonight. Be gentle on the puppies outside if you do say hello and enjoy the rest of your evening. <laughs>